This is really unique experience with Ruby. I'm Jesse Stormer. I've had a lot of people tell me they don't recognize me from this picture. <laughs> this is my Twitter picture. Just you can put the person to the picture. That's me. Uh, I work for Shopify in Canada. And then I also have uh, published these ebooks kind of on point to talk about today. So, we're going to be talking about uh, Unix and Ruby. It's a technical talk. I'm going to show you some cool Unix stuff you can do with Ruby. It's often thought of as the domain of like, C programming. But you can do so many things that we can the comfort of Ruby. And we're going to talk about these guys before, right? <laughs> yeah. So a few years ago, in 2009, I was a Rails programmer. Uh, I had a grip on Rails and Ruby, and I came across this blog post by Ren Tomato about Unicorn, a uh, web server in Ruby that does a lot of Unix and stuff. It was a good timing for me because I was ready to learn something new. I knew a lot about Rails. I knew nothing about low level stuff. I didn't have a full computer science education. So Ryan uh, suggested checking out Unicorn, linked to the main source file, which looks like this. <laughs> I opened it up and I was kind of like, whoa, what did I do with this? Um, it's really long, a lot of indentation, a lot of methods. But I read through it and I realized there was a lot of methods I'd never seen before. A lot of stuff I didn't understand. The more I read, the more I was kind of impressed. It was, even though it wasn't like normal Ruby code I would see, it was a certain confidence, there was a lot of elegance. This guy was using stuff that was obviously powerful, but that I had never seen. So if you're looking at Ruby documentation, looking at manual pages, getting some books, I started to figure out what Unicorn does, how it works. Um, and I want to share some of that with you today. So we're going to talk about Unicorn. Unicorn, if you've never heard of it, is a web server for Rack apps. Can I see hands if you've ever deployed an app on Unicorn? Cool, lots of you. Uh, now hands if you've ever opened the source code. So very few. Any contributors? OK, I don't see any. Oh, one. So I'm not a contributor. I have studied and learned from the source code, but uh, can't take credit for the project. So from the website, Unicorn is a rack HTTP server for fast clients and Unix. For today, we're going to ignore most of it, and just so I can teach you some stuff, I'll talk about the way it manages Unix processes. Um, that's why it's makes it special. The first feature I want to talk about is called pre forking. Before we go there, we should talk about forking and make sure we understand what that is. So when I say fork, we're talking about the fork system call. This is the manual page for it. It talks you do it. an example C code in the description. Also, we know the most important part. Fork creates a new process. So let's do it in Ruby. In the bottom half of the screen, I'm just showing the list of IRB processes. Very started when we saw the list. I'm just matching the process IDs. Then I'll call fork. And you see I get back a new process ID. Two IRBs. <coughs> and the other thing you'll notice is that I kind of have two return values there. There's one right after the fork, which is a number, and there's a nil that I've got highlighted. So as far as I know, the fork is the only Ruby method that returns twice. I don't need it returns two values like in an array. I need it returns two times. The reason is the fork creates a new process. Because we all the processes now, they both return, we both write the standard out. So I decided to return values. So because it returns twice, you can do crazy things like challenge your understanding of these elements. So say if or one thing else with the thing. And if I run this, it sure looks like it's true and false. <laughs> I start to think this stuff is dangerous, but it's just matter of understanding what's really happening. So let's do it again. This time in each, in each uh, in the, the true part and the false part, I'll print the process IDs as well. You really see the difference. So this time around, I'll run it again. 
And as you can probably guess, um, you're going to see the same output, but both of those blocks have different process IDs. So it's kind of interesting that even though they're in the same source file, they're right beside each other in code, they're running in separate processes on the system. So I'm going to revise this statement. Fork doesn't really return twice. It returns once, but in two processes. So where there was one, there are now two going in parallel. And the if uh, construct is kind of weird. It's usually how you do it in, uh, in C. But of course, in Ruby, you have more elegant solutions, more elegant DSLs. So the way you normally use fork is to get a block. And that block would get or evaluated in the child process, the, the newly created process. You have to really touch it. And the last thing I want to show you about fork before we continue is how it shares memory. So we create an array 1.5. Process, no process, I can modify the array and then we took what I got. In the column process, you're going to see what the effect is on the array. So, normal Ruby scoping, um, you know, if something happens inside a block to an instance variable, it would affect the same variable, you know, in that instance. But in this case, you run it. See that the two have different arrays. This is because when you fork a process, it's something you're asking the operating system to do. So when you fork a process, it copies everything in memory, copies open file descriptors, it copies the Ruby virtual machine. You now have two Rubies where there's one, and since the processes can't access each other's memory, they've got separate copies. So let's uh, add one more thing here. Fork creates an exact copy. Uh, we'll, we'll talk later about how it can optimize this, but from your perspective, it's an exact copy. So this is the code we just saw. And you may think, oh, maybe this is a trick of instance variables or something. This is kind of weird. If you change this to globals, it's the same effect because effectively the code inside the block is running in a totally separate process, cannot be affected by the other code after the block. Oh, and process wait there is just so that the uh, original process waits for the child to finish its work, make sure that we've uh, deleted something from the array. So we learned about forking. It creates a new process. And the process is a copy. Um, we could use that to understand what pre-forking is all about. And pre-forking is really cool. Uh, it's really cool because it leverages what the operating system has to offer. It pushes as much as it can onto the operating system. And it's not a new idea. The fork uh, man page that I showed earlier, if you scroll to the bottom on my Mac, the date is 1993. And I mean, the fork API has really been unchanged for 30, 40 years. It's a very old idea. Apache, in some configurations, can do it. Same with Passenger, Nginx, and Unicorn. So Unicorn didn't invent this stuff. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick like a pseudocode example of, of how Unicorn boots up. So if you were to open the Unicorn gem, go to the HTTP server class, these are two methods you would see among lots of others. Uh, the start method, which gets called, that, that's basically the entry point. So what does it do? It opens a listener socket and loads your, your Rack app or your Rails app. Then it, however many workers you want, it forks them and they enter a loop. Now, we've got two concurrent processes running in this loop, right? Two workers. Each of them gets connections off the socket. Process client uh, calls the Rack app. So let's, I'm going to explain this in a bit more detail, but I want to show you a diagram. So this is the, the master process. It's got a socket and the Rack app in memory. Uh, it forks. Now it's got two workers ready to handle your app. Two parallel processes. Now, you might look at this and say, okay, uh, what, what have we really got here? You know, two processes ready to handle the app. Why didn't we just, like with Mongrel or some other server, you could just boot up two at the command line. What's the real gain here if we're having to copy everything over? But thanks to Fork and thanks to uh, something called copy on write, Fork can actually be faster and use less memory than booting th these things up uh, by hand. And I mean, two, 
two processes, not exciting. At Shopify, we have uh, 70, like seven zero parallel processes per machine. So the savings is really magnified. So copy and write, what is that? Uh, well, Ruby has a funny history with copy and write, but it's a, it's a kernel feature such that when you fork a process, it doesn't actually copy all the memory. As long as it can, it lets them both reference the same part of memory. And if one of them decides to change that, then it gets its own copy. But think about how much of your stuff, how much stuff in your rack app never changes. When you load Rails, when you load gems, when you load your, your model business logic, you don't modify that stuff at runtime. So the parent process should be able to load that, fork the workers, they can share that memory, it should never need to be copied. So you could save a ton of memory that way. But if you're using MRI 1.8 or 1.9, which probably a lot of us are, uh, it's not copy and write friendly. So it actually kind of like disables this feature. And it's thanks to the garbage collector. The garbage collector, you may have heard, uses a mark and sweep strategy. What that means is it looks at all the objects in memory and marks bits on them, saying which ones need to be swept. So it's, it's effectively writing all over the place. So when you fork a process, copy and write, saves you the memory. As soon as you run the garbage collector, all those savings are effectively nil. So if you're, doing, if you're using Unicorn, if you're doing a lot of forking and you want to uh, you know, make best use of resources, MRI 2.0 has solved this, Ruby Enterprise Edition, that's one reason why it e exists in the first place. The bottom one is a, a version of MRI with some 2.0 stuff backported like the copy and write friendly garbage collector. And the way that these guys get around it, they still use mark and sweep, but instead of writing all over the place, they store all the little uh, the bits in one little part of memory. So you can end up preserving all that, uh, all that shared memory. So back to this example. I said pre-forking was awesome. Why is it awesome? Uh, well, because if you want to spin up a bunch of parallel workers for your app, you can save a ton of memory and do it a lot quicker than spawning processes yourself. Like, when I, when I say yourself, I mean like, trying to do it 70 times from the command line, everyone's competing for resources. And this way, the master loads the app once, the fork is pretty quick. All the workers can uh, share the same piece of memory. And theoretically, you should get tons of savings. That's one reason why it's awesome. The other reason is, um, I was talking about memory, but I also mentioned that in a fork, uh, open files are, are shared, sockets are shared. So the master opens a listener socket, and it doesn't take any connections. And each of the workers, as part of its loop, they accept connections. And so these, this is a, the accept system call that they use. And the kernel does, a job, does the job of making sure that only, each connection only goes to one worker, that things are load balanced nicely, things are queued fairly. You don't need any kind of a, a proxy in front of Unicorn to talk to each worker. It pushes all that down to the kernel, and the kernel handles it nicely. So yeah, pre-forking is awesome, because you can get faster boot time, uh, you can save more memory, you get great uh, connection load balancing features from the kernel. Let's do another uh, unicorn feature. It can replace an instance of itself without losing any connections. This is like a zero downtime restart. The most obvious example of when you want to do this is uh, if you want to you know, deploy a new version of your app. You write some new code, ready to put a new app online. So this uh, gets triggered by, you send a, like if you wanted to, to deploy new code, you would put the code in place, you would send a user to a signal to the master, which would tell it, uh, here, we'll, we'll look at the code. Send a user to signal, which would trigger this method. Again, this is pseudocode, but if you look uh, inside the unicorn HTTP server class, you'll see a method called reexec. And you see the, the two components here are a fork and an exec. We haven't touched on exec yet. It's another system call. Straight from the man page, exec transforms the, uh, 
calling process into a new process. Let's do it in Ruby. So I print hi, I uh, exec a command, print by. So when I run this, I'm going to see the, the ls output scroll by. And if I go back, I can see, see it says hi. Um, but it doesn't say by. And the reason is because what that exec did, it, it printed hi, then it called exec, which effectively blew away the Ruby process. It replaced it with ls. So ls did its thing, and it exited, and that was it. Ru Ruby is effectively gone in that, place, in that case, replaced. So how does Unicorn replace itself? Well, the, uh, wh what's happening here is it forks a new process off the master. It grabs the uh, arguments it was called with. This is a uh, list of file descriptor numbers that its listening sockets are, are listening on. And then it calls exec. The, lis the listener uh, socket file descriptor numbers is important because just like you can share a socket through fork, you can share a socket through exec. So this is, this is like at the, the point with the most processes, this is what you'll see. The old master has forked uh, on the left a new master. That new master has called exec on itself with unicorn, so which is gonna load up a new process, load up the rack app as before. This time instead of opening a listener socket, it's just gonna reopen the one it got passed from the, the old master. So from the outside world, the socket never closes. In the inside world, there's only one socket, too. And if you ask the kernel, there's only one socket. In this diagram, there are six handles on that socket. They can all work with it, um, but there's still just one. So when the new, when the new master and its workers are ready, uh, you kill the old one, and you end up with the same kind of process tree as before. And this way, when you deploy new stuff, the socket gets passed down the tree, the tree grows and shrinks, but there's never any effect on the outside world. So this is the uh, URL for Unicorn. You should definitely check it out. Besides just what I talked about, there's lots of other cool features. I, mean, I talked about pre-forking and it, how it does restarts. If you want to look around at it and see what other kind of stuff it does, the self-pipe trick is pretty cool. Um, and really, there's lots of cool stuff in there. So, what did we actually talk about? We talked about um, some unicorn features, but the concepts were really built around fork and exec. So if you only take away one thing today, let it be this statement, fork and exec. Because fork and exec, you know, fork copy the current process, exec transform it. It's at the heart of process spawning in Unix everywhere. All these methods in Ruby, Process spawn, system, backticks, p open. If you look at the source, they all do fork and exec. So there's no, there's no magic to them. That's that's their, uh, that's how they do it. This is process spawn from Rubinius. Among other things, it does fork and exec. Just as one example. And fork and exec isn't just for Ruby. Uh, it's for lots of programming languages, and even for your shell. When you do in your shell, curl Google, and send the output to a file, if you're implementing that shell in Ruby, you might do something like this. You fork the shell, you set up the environment that the command needs. In this case, you redirect standard out to a file. You might also set an environment variable. You might um, you know, point standard out to a pipe instead. And then you exec the command. And typically the shell uh, waits, makes you wait till the command is done to do the next one. So fork and exec is very, uh, it's really at the heart of Unix. So I said I would talk about these guys too. The guy on the left is Ken. The guy on the right is Dennis. Ken is the original author of Unix. Dennis is the original author of C about 40 years ago. 40 years ago. These guys obviously collaborated a lot, and given their history, they have credit for the original Unix beards. Now, 
Unique spirits are kind of a funny thing. Sometimes, like in the case of these guys, you might think it denotes wisdom, respect. Sometimes you see a beard like that and think that the guy spends too much time in his parents' basement. Um, I never really gave it too much thought until I read this a few months ago. The eunuch's beard is really an extension of the philosopher's beard and the academic's beard. And I thought that was so on point to how I see them. When I read stuff that they wrote years ago, you know, they weren't um, looking to change the world or to make a lot of money. They were doing research. They were looking to find, about, find truths about programming, about, <coughs> about operating systems, about language design. Um, so I have a ton of respect for these guys. But uh, not everyone has to grow a beard. <laughs> the guy on the right is Linus Torvalds, obviously a Unix hacker and no beard. So I certainly wouldn't want to encourage everyone to go and grow a beard. If you feel like doing it, that's great. But you can have a figurative one too. Um, so I'm going to leave off with a quick story. I've got a three-year-old daughter. I would like to read this book. It's a Dr. Seuss book. It's about a young guy. He's learning the alphabet, A to Z. He uh, learns all the letters. A is for apple, B is for bear, Z is for zebra. Uh, and an, an older kid comes along and says, oh, you don't, you don't know much. Uh, let me show you something else. And shows him these crazy Dr. Seuss letters and Dr. Seuss words. But in the end, the younger kid discovers some stuff the older guy didn't know. So then my, my challenge to you is if you've learned something new today or if you've seen something you haven't seen before, if you spend most of your days doing web programming, try and find out something you haven't found before. Look in Unicorn, it's a good place to start, and help me learn some more stuff I don't know. So I'm a bit early, I think, but um, that's the end. If you are interested in my books, you can get a discount code there. Uh, I've got a few uh, copies to give away up here if anybody wants one. I think I've got time for questions. So thanks. The only thing I've ever seen about it is that there was a commit saying, let's do it like Nginx does. So I guess you'd have to ask uh, someone who knows more about Nginx. I saw another hand at the back. The question was, why is it necessary to fork a process in order to exec a different one? Uh, are you asking why there isn't uh, some, something that puts those two together? So the question was, fork seems to do two things, creates a new process and inherits the environment. What can you do if you don't need the environment? So I'll have a two-part answer. The first is, there is something called POSIX spawn, which gets you what you want. Uh, you POSIX spawn, give it a, a command, and it creates a new process that doesn't inherit the environment of the old process, which makes it much quicker, and spawns a new process. It's something that uh, is not supported everywhere. It's not supported in core Ruby. There's a gem for it, POSIX spawn, I think it's called. And the other reason that I'd say is, I think a lot of this stuff, like I said, fork is a very old concept. And if you look at a lot of system calls, well, when I look at them, I see people who were like basically designing the system they needed to write shells and to write programs they needed a long time ago. And that stuff is still useful today, so it still sticks around and it's the most widely uh, available. But it, it is written for times past. Yes. If you're running 70 processes, do you do y'all use RE or like or do you just have like 11 billion RAM? <laughs> Both. Uh, we used to, we used to use uh, REE. We switched to uh, 193, uh, like stock 193, and we only saw like the the new VM saves so much memory that we only saw a little bit of a loss. But we're now using that patched version in production, which has a different speed patches as well as the copy and write patch, and it's been wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about the other, you mentioned a couple of versions of MRI. What about the other implementations, say Ruby, Rubinius? Actually, is there anybody here who knows if Rubinius is copy and write friendly? I, I couldn't find out. Um, 
the JVM doesn't support fork. So in, order, in its efforts to be uh, cross-platform compatible, like on Windows and stuff, Windows doesn't support fork. JRuby doesn't support fork. Um, Rubinius does, but I don't know if it's copy and write friendly. Uh, I believe the garbage collector is copy and write friendly. Okay. Okay, let's take your word for it. Yes, back there. Uh, for itself, for 2.0, you know what I'm saying? For copy and write? Is, the question was, is the backwards, is the backported stuff from 2.0 uh, stable? We're using it in production at Shopify. I use it for development every day. It's been stable for me. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so uh, just saying that JRuby is heavily uh, encouraged to using threads instead of processes. Yeah. So the question was, isn't that a better model for what needs to be done? It really depends on your needs, right? JRuby is great with threads because the JVM is great with threads. MRI, for instance, if you're doing threading, thanks to the, the global VM lock, uh, threads aren't really happening in parallel. Multiple processes, you do get parallelization, and you do get uh, you know, shared memory, which is big savings. So I, I, I can't say that one is better than the other. It depends on uh, what you're deployed on, depends on what your needs are. Of course, the best thing to do is to test and, and uh, these metrics. Yeah. Of course, if you use Fork and Exec, you get a copy. So you don't have to worry about the state and the threads. Yeah. Great point, which is that if you're using Fork, you don't have to worry about shared state with threads or locking or synchronization. It's a much simpler approach. Yeah. What's your favorite system call? <laughs> favorite system call. Uh, I'd have to say fork, just because it's so useful. I mean, it's been said that it, it may not do what you want every time, but I find it so useful in so many places. I know there's some with funny names, but I can't think of any right now. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Yeah. Do you find yourself sending signals randomly on the command line now, like you didn't do before you learned about <laughs> processes? Yeah, I find myself sending signals randomly on the command line before I knew, like, now that I know about signals. Um, maybe not randomly, but I know how to, you know, I know what kill dash nine means now. <laughs> uh, who else? Yeah, Adam again. Do you find yourself using any kind of IDC inside sockets, like uh, like that? So the question was, do you find yourself using any IPC uh, mechanisms besides sockets or, or pipes, I assume. Stuff like shared memory or maybe POSIX queues. Um, I never have in Ruby. I, I think there might be gems for some of that stuff, but not in Ruby core. So like, if you want to communicate between processes, you can use pipes or sockets, but if you want to do memory mapping or uh, shared memory, I'm not sure how to do it in Ruby. I never have. Yeah? Let's talk about this, uh, you had 70 yeah. How does the kernel determine which one gets served first come first served? Yeah. So when they all call uh, accept, that's a, a blocking call. So they're all waiting, and I presume that you know first one in gets first in the queue, and next one next in the queue. But I, I don't know the kernel source that well. Who else? That's it. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.